What's up guys, it's Dom Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to Linfamy's How the Early Japanese Dealt with China. This is from his History Japan series, it's the sixth part, we've reacted to all five of the first parts. Um, going to be going through them all again, very long, I think it's something like 72, but uh, we'll slowly be getting through them all. So link to the original video down below, remember to like, comment, subscribe to help the algorithm, and uh, let's see how this goes. Boy was a time of war, of clan chieftains fighting for the best lands. And so, you may think this video would be about exciting battles and strategies and such. Well, it's not. Welcome to the frustration of studying this period in Japanese history. The Yayoi had no written language. Yeah, I don't think... Uh, I'm not sure exactly which time period we're talking about here. I think he said up until about uh, 200 AD, something like that, if I'm not mistaken. I could be a little bit off. Um, but, yeah, the Japanese really didn't they adopted calligraphy from the chinese right obviously the kanji system comes from chinese kanji um and on top of that we really don't have much history of them prior to their founding mythology which a lot of that starts around like the 700s um so it would be i guess like the early medieval period in europe is kind of when you start seeing actual like l literary works coming out of japan uh so yeah they were you know, very much is just this kind of society on the periphery of China for a large percentage of the history, right? So most of what we know is from archaeological evidence, not from actual written records, or it's from, you know, third-party sources like the Chinese writing about them or whatever. It was a time when alliances were formed and broken, a time of heroes and intrigue and betrayals, but we have no written records of any of it. The only records we have are from the Chinese sources that yep. bothered to write down things about these barbarians to the east. They mentioned wars, but didn't much care for details. Now, to understand the Yayoi period, we can't just talk about the Yayoi people by themselves. The picture would be incomplete. We need to talk about the elephant in the room. An elephant named China. Mm -hmm. Psst, don't miss out. Click subscribe and the bell. China was the high school cheerleader of ancient Asia. I'll explain. First, I need to impress upon you China's overwhelming presence. When the Yayoi period began in 300 BC, various Chinese dynasties have been around for nearly 2,000 years, supposedly. And it was during this period that the Chinese Han Dynasty began, considered a golden age of China. Most modern Chinese still call themselves Han. While the Chinese were inventing things like paper and the Pythagorean theorem, the Yayoi were just getting into agriculture. Imagine you're the ancient Greeks, and next door is the modern United States of America. The feeling of inadequacy the Yayoi would have felt is like when you bring a baking soda volcano to the science fair, then you see Kevin waltz in with a toaster that runs on farts and happiness. What the <laughs> hell, Kevin? How am I supposed to compete with that? Well, when I was kind of an aside, but when I was at my grade eight science fair. Our teachers literally told us that nobody's allowed to bring a volcano because, like, fucking t 10 people every year tried to do the volcano because it's such, like, a classic movie and TV show trope that you see in movies and TV all the time. So you weren't allowed to do a volcano. Well, look who's got the last laugh now. You're working on cancer research, and I'm on YouTube. The Han had plenty <laughs> of contact with the Yayoi, and they wrote them down. You know the phrase, history is written by the victors? In this case, history is written by the Chinese, and we need to keep this in mind. A lot of what we know of the Yayoi, outside of the archaeological evidence, is viewed through the eye. Yeah, the entire concept of history is written by the victors is really inaccurate, to say the least, right? Um, like the Bronze Age collapse, almost everything we know about it was written by the losers, right? Because the victors didn't have writing systems, or at least not ones that we've discovered. Um, you know, the entire... Uh, uh, what's it called? The uh, I can't remember the exact terminology for it, but there's you know a lot of civil war history was written by Southerners. Um, Lost cause, Lost cause mythology was written by Southerners. Um, you know, even nowadays when you look at like a lot of his, uh, you know, modern reinterpretations of history that come you know post like the 1960s and 70s cultural revolutions. Um, a lot of them are, you know, written by, in a lot of cases, people who lost those wars, right? Uh, history is written by whoever wants to spend time writing history, right? That, that's about it. And you're all, you, you'll have conflicting opinions on, you know, different sides 
Right? That's why there's, like, even Nazi apologists, right? The Nazis lost the war, but you'll still have people attempting to write history books about, like, you know, being Nazi apologists. Um, the Soviets lost the Cold War, but you still have communists trying to rewrite Cold War history. Um, yeah, history is not always written by the victors. That's just, you know, something people say a lot of the time to cope, I feel like. Uh, it's very inaccurate. Eyes of the Chinese. We have records of various Yayoi kingdoms sending expeditions to China to establish relationships and trade with the Chinese court. Trade was done in a unique way. You see, the Chinese believed that their emperor carried the mandates of heaven, which declares that the emperor had ultimate authority over earth. Any non-Chinese state could never be considered equal. If a country sought a relationship... So, so that's not actually because of the mandate of heaven, that's because of the idea of the middle kingdom. The mandate of heaven is specifically when it refers to China, is about how China um, basically views their emperor cycles, right? So you ha you have the mandate of heaven, which means basically the gods have decided that you have the right to rule um, because you're doing a good job, and you can lose the mandate of heaven and be overthrown by somebody who has been granted the mandate of heaven. This is how they like uh, basically justify regime change and you know no royal bloodline like you see in like a lot of European countries or in a lot of uh, or in Japan, where Japan's had the same royal family for something like 1,300 years. A lot of the European royals, same thing. They're all from houses that are, you know, thousands of years old. Uh, China did things a little bit differently, where, you know, sometimes you'd have these emperors who would reign for four, five, six, seven, ten generations. But eventually, somebody would overthrow them and they would be, you know, granted the mandate of heaven. The The concept of, like, not seeing other countries as equals because China viewed itself as the middle kingdom. Uh, basically, they were the center of the world. Uh, and uh, the Greeks actually had a kind of semi-similar concept. Um, a lot of it had to do with, like, anything north was, like, you know, ba basically the idea that, like, they had the perfect geography and that was given to them by the gods. And, like, you know, to the west of them was, like, all these deserts and mountains. To the east of them was just the ocean and Japan. Um, to the north, it was Siberia. And to the south, it's just all jungle. You know, we got the perfect land because the gods granted it onto us. And that's why, you know, we are this perfect society above everyone else. It's very much a, the, about the middle kingdom, not so much about the mandate of heaven. That's much more about, like, internal Chinese politics. ...with China. It did so as an inferior tributary state and had to pay homage to the emperor. The Chinese court did not trade normally with other countries. Now they want to tribute. Would a fair exchange between equals, and China was not equal to you, damn it. Therefore, they used what is called the Shady Massage Parlor System, or SMP. I will explain. John goes to a Shady Massage Parlor and gets the regular massage for $20. Then he tips the masseuse $100, and he gets the irregular massage. <laughs> Technically, John did not pay for the extra services. He gave a voluntary gift of $100, and the masseuse gave him a token of appreciation in return. And that's how it works at a shady massage parlor. <laughs> I know this through a friend, of course. A friend named Destiny. No. So trade was done like this. A yayoi king... <laughs> is he talking about, like, Destiny the fucking YouTuber? Uh, this is four years old. I don't know if Destiny was that big back then. He's pretty... Like, he's huge now, but... Uh, I don't know if that's like Destiny, yeah, uh, or maybe that's Destiny's like the stripper name. I don't know. That's yeah. Kingdom would offer items as tribute to the Chinese court, and the court, in its generosity, would bestow gifts and legitimacy to the Yayoi Kingdom and its leader. This way, it's technically not a trade between equals. One side freely offers a tribute; the other freely offers a gift. S M P. All right, fine. It's actually called the tributary system. Yeah. The Yayoi were pretty much fine with this arrangement. Gifts made them especially happy. This tribute system often expanded to large trade networks. There is evidence of a vast trade network all over Japan, including the Ryukyu Islands. In the first century... A yeah, and uh, what's interesting is this trade actually obviously like goes into Korea, goes into China, goes all the way down. And we've found evidence of the Chinese having trade networks down all the way to like the northern tip of Australia, as far back as about 1500, 1600 years ago, maybe earlier, but that's the earliest evidence we found. Um, and then obviously from Japan, you'd also have trade routes all the way to Rome. Uh, they have found Roman coins in Japan. Uh, not very many, but you know, basically if you were connected to any one node on the mainland, you would be connected to, you know, basically all of Afro-Eurasia and even down into uh, northern, you know, Australia. 
So really interesting how how you know no one person would travel these trade routes until basically the European Middle Ages, and then you start to have you know different people throughout you know Marco Polo, even Kadun. Um, I'm probably mispronouncing even his name, um, but yeah, a lot of these people you know from especially from like Islamic countries and from European countries to travel all over these uh, different places. Um, Voices of the Past does some really good uh, videos on this kind of stuff. But yeah, if you were on one note of this, then you could get stuff from the far side of the world if you were willing to pay enough. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the time it was just somebody from here would go trade here, this guy would go trade here, this guy would go trade here. So most people didn't go out of you know one or two spots of their trade node. But eventually, you know, you get stuff from like the far side of the world. Um, yeah. AD, there were reports of many tribal leaders in Kyushu sending tribute missions to a Chinese outpost in the Korean Peninsula. Foreign goods entered Japan by way of Kyushu, then flowed from Kyushu to the rest of Japan. In one recorded case of contact, the Han court bestowed upon the ruler of the kingdom of Na a gold seal. No, seal. The inscription on it reads roughly, King of the Na state of Wa, vassal of the Han. This seal still exists now in a museum and is designated a national treasure of Japan. Now, were the Yayoi just vain and wanted to show off bling from China? Ooh, look at my cool bell. Oh no, it was mainly about one thing, power. In high school, recognition from a cheerleader or a jock gave you status and power. In the same way, <laughs> recognition by the Chinese court granted you legitimacy and status in the eyes of your people and the other Yayoi kingdoms. China was the high school cheerleader of ancient Asia. Rulers distributed these Chinese gifts to supporters. They were symbols of power and authority. That's such a funny comparison. I've never heard it put that way. I mean, I guess it's fairly accurate in, in some regards, but it's just so funny because I've never heard anyone attempt to put it that way. This is not to say that China controlled the Yayoi. Not at all. The Yayoi were very much autonomous. There were long periods where they did not have any contact with China. But there was a long list of Yayoi leaders sending missions to China to gain power. Because of these leaders, power tended to flow from the mainland to the Yayoi kingdoms with the closest relations to China. Power consolidated there until a kingdom called Yamatai emerged to rule over Japan. Kinda. Kinda. I'm guessing he'll get to that in the next one, but yeah, uh, great video. I, I really like this guy's videos. He's one of the better uh, people as far as like East Asian content goes. A anyone, let me know below. Uh, you know, stuff that's on like you know Southeast Asia, East Asia, or um, the Indian subcontinent. I'm really wanting to learn more about like the history in those areas because I, I know quite a bit about European history and North American history, but um, when it comes to you know the Eurasian side of or the Asian side of Eurasia I just don't really know that much so if anyone wants to like link me some good channels that'd be great uh but anyway like comment subscribe and I'll see you in the next one